For the last 500 years, the West has been by far the most economically important region on the planet. Why the West has ruled the world for so long is perhaps the greatest question in all of human history. Its effects still reverberate in the spheres of geopolitics, economics and historical study, whilst continuing to shape the lives of each and every one of us. In this video, we tackle this question as comprehensively as possible. We'll delve into the initial conditions that provided Eurasia with an advantage over other continents like Africa and the Americas, before exploring why Western Europe, as opposed to other formidable empires like China, emerged as the preeminent global power. Join us today as we delve into the complexities of this deeply significant and fascinating topic. We will first adopt the broadest approach possible, examining extensive timeframes and analyzing entire continents. We will begin by exploring why Eurasia, as opposed to Africa, the Americas, or Oceania, became the birthplace of the majority of advanced civilizations. A key work that employs this broad lens is Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs and Steel. Diamond posits that geography is the primary factor influencing the varying rates of societal development. Specifically, Eurasia's natural resources provided significant early advantages compared to other regions of the world. These included the availability of a wide range of domesticable plants and animals, along with a climate conducive to agriculture. The Fertile Crescent, spanning parts of the modern-day Middle East, was one of the earliest regions to develop agriculture. Rich in a variety of easily domesticable species, it was the original home to wheat and barley, among the first crops to be domesticated. Additionally, this region boasted a wealth of other key crops, such as peas, lentils, apples, grapes, rye and oats. The importance of crop diversity to civilizations cannot be overstated. Varied crops offer essential nutrients crucial for human health, contributing to a balanced diet and mitigating the risks associated with a monocrop diet, such as malnutrition and deficiency diseases. More significantly, reliance on a limited number of crops exposes a society to risks like crop failure due to pests, diseases, soil depletion or adverse weather conditions. Consequently, Civilizations with a diverse agricultural base are more likely to endure in the long term. Furthermore, Eurasia was home to many of the world's domesticable animal species, including cows, pigs and sheep, thereby providing reliable food sources and further strengthening its agricultural foundation. In contrast, other continents were less fortunate. This is particularly evident in Australia, which lacks large native mammals suitable for domestication. The continent's largest native mammals, marsupials like kangaroos, were unsuitable for domestication due to their behavior, diet and breeding patterns. Moreover, the native plants of Australia were generally not amenable to domestication or large-scale agriculture. Consequently, indigenous Australians traditionally adopted a hunter-gatherer lifestyle managing the landscape with techniques such as fire stick farming, but without developing agriculture based on domesticated plants. Despite some challenges we will explore in a moment, Africa and the Americas were more suitable places for civilization than Australia. Several notable agricultural settled societies existed in both Africa and the Americas. In the Americas, civilizations such as the Maya, Aztecs, Olmecs and Incas stand out as notable examples. These societies relied heavily on staple crops native to the Americas, including quinoa, potatoes and maize. In Africa, there were also numerous notable empires, such as the incredibly wealthy Mali Empire under Mansa Musa and the ancient Egyptians. Africa's connection to Eurasia also allowed for the adoption of grains from the Fertile Crescent, complementing their own native species like millet, teff and yams. However, African and American civilizations faced unique challenges not present within Eurasia. Jared Diamond highlights that unlike Eurasia's east-west axis, the Americas and, to a lesser extent, Africa, are oriented along a north-south axis. This orientation results in significant variations in climate, day length, 
and seasonal patterns across these continents. For instance, in the Americas, crops that were domesticated in one region often required extensive adaptation to thrive in areas with different latitudes and climates. The original strains of corn from Mesoamerica, for example, were not immediately suitable for the temperate climates of North America. It took centuries of selective breeding and adaptation to develop corn varieties that could prosper in the cooler and more varied climates of the North. This geographical alignment also created physical barriers. The northward spread of corn from Mesoamerica was impeded by the arid and inhospitable regions of northern Mexico and the southwestern United States. Diamond presents a similar situation for Africa. While the north-south orientation of Africa is less pronounced than in the Americas, the continent is still characterized by a vast and diverse range of climates and ecosystems, ranging from deserts and rainforests to savannas and temperate zones. This diversity posed significant challenges to developing uniform agricultural practices and spreading crops and technologies across the continent. Consequently, while Africa had a variety of indigenous crops, Many were specific to certain regions and not as easily adaptable to other parts of the continent. The presence, or lack thereof, of domesticable animals in Africa and the Americas also played a crucial role in hindering the spread and advancement of agriculture. In Eurasia, domesticated animals served not only as an additional food source, but also as a catalyst for the dissemination of agricultural technologies and practices. Apart from llamas in the Americas, which were not as versatile, the absence of domesticable animals meant that the spread of agricultural innovations was slower and less efficient compared to Eurasia. In Africa, the situation was similar. The challenges of domesticating African animals, such as zebras and African elephants, limited their utility in agriculture, transportation and other human activities. Despite Africa's geographical connection to Eurasia, which theoretically provided access to Eurasian domesticated animals, other factors hindered their utilization. The diverse African environments that impeded crop dissemination also restricted the spread of domesticated animals. Factors like climate, which was too hot and arid for some Eurasian animals, disease, parasites, and the lack of suitable grazing land further complicated the situation. Consequently, the propagation of agricultural technologies and general trade faced substantial obstacles in much of Africa. Jared Diamond argues that these geographic constraints significantly hampered the technological progress of civilizations in Africa and the Americas. Unlike in Eurasia, where food surpluses supported larger, more settled populations, many areas in Africa and the Americas did not reach similar levels of urbanization. In Eurasia, food abundance allowed individuals to specialize in various trades and crafts. This specialization fostered an environment where people could dedicate time to developing new tools, constructing buildings, refining agricultural methods, or engaging in scientific research, all contributing to technological progress. Additionally, the geographic conditions in Eurasia were more favorable for trade, allowing innovations to travel long distances. For example, a discovery made in Beijing could eventually reach London through the Silk Road, even in ancient times. In stark contrast, an invention by the Aztecs was unlikely to reach the Incas, hindered by the natural barriers inherent to the geographical orientation of the Americas. Where Africa and the Americas differ is in the role of diseases. Africa, historically, has grappled with a high burden of infectious diseases, including malaria, sleeping sickness, and yellow fever. The widespread prevalence of diseases like malaria and sleeping sickness significantly influenced settlement patterns and agricultural practices on the continent, especially in more tropical regions. With a few notable exceptions, the pervasive threat of these diseases, particularly in Central Africa, restricted the development of densely populated urban areas and large-scale farming. Thus, settled areas in such disease-prone regions would have struggled to thrive due to the impact of these tropical diseases. In contrast, the Americas presented an almost opposite scenario concerning disease impact. As previously noted, 
the Americas had far fewer domesticable animals compared to Eurasia. This is crucial because many of the deadliest germs in human history are believed to have originated in animals domesticated by humans. Diseases like smallpox, influenza, and measles likely evolved from pathogens that initially affected livestock. In Eurasia, prolonged and close contact with domestic animals created conditions conducive for these diseases to cross species barriers and infect humans. However, Native American populations, having been isolated from the rest of the world for millennia, lacked immunity to these common Eurasian diseases. Therefore, when they eventually came into contact with European and Asian populations, the impact was devastating. In parts of the Americas, the indigenous population declined by up to 90% or more within a century, following first contact with Europeans. This catastrophic loss of life led to the collapse of social structures, including political systems, economies, and entire cultures, severely undermining the ability of these societies to resist European colonization. Eurasia, on the other hand, occupied a sort of Goldilocks zone in terms of disease burden. It was not so overwhelmed by disease as to prevent the formation of large urban centers, as was often the case in parts of Africa. At the same time, the disease burden in Eurasia was not so low that contact with other civilizations led to the kind of societal collapse seen in the Americas. This relative balance allowed Eurasian societies to develop robust immune defenses against a variety of diseases without being crippled by them, positioning them advantageously in the context of global interactions and colonization. But that is not to say that disease did not affect the Eurasian continent and its role as a future power. In fact, in many ways, the Black Death is often argued to be the catalyst which eventually allowed Europe to diverge not only from Oceania, Africa and the Americas, but also from other major Eurasian centers such as India and China. India, for instance, appeared to have emerged from the Black Death relatively unscathed. There is little evidence to suggest that the death toll in India was as high as in other parts of Eurasia. Its caste system remained intact, and society did not undergo any major transformations attributable to the pandemic. China, on the other hand, was severely affected by the Black Death, with estimates suggesting up to half of the population may have perished. However, China's response to the pandemic was arguably more effective than that of Europe. Governed by a strong centralized authority, China was able to implement uniform responses to both the pandemic and the resultant economic challenges. Consequently, despite severe hardships, China's ancient centralized system, which had been dominant for millennia, continued. Europe's experience was markedly different. The continent was fragmented among various rival kings, feudal lords and princes, preventing any unified response to the Black Death. Scholars like Jared Diamond have suggested that this fragmentation is a characteristic feature of Europe's geography. The continent's peninsulas, rivers and mountains naturally lead to a balkanized landscape. Diamond further argues that Europe's staple crop, wheat, influenced the fundamental culture of the region. Wheat farming, which requires less constant care or irrigation than rice, could be managed by individual families or small groups, potentially fostering a sense of individualism and independence that led to smaller political states. In contrast, rice farming in regions like China typically demands a more complex irrigation system and a higher degree of cooperative labor. This need for collective effort in irrigation and intensive labor could promote more communal and collectivist social structures, supporting larger, more united empires. While there is some validity to these arguments, they may be overly deterministic. Historical examples like the Roman Empire demonstrate that Europe has experienced periods of unity. The Roman Empire, while more individualistic compared to its contemporary Confucian Chinese counterparts, also exhibited a collectivist approach in many aspects. Therefore, while geographical and agricultural factors might have made Europe less inclined towards unity or collectivism, it was not impossible for Europe to have remained united under a more collectivist ideology.
Regardless of the specific reasons for medieval Europe's fragmentation, the fact of the matter is, it was distinctly different from the unified governance of China. This difference had significant implications when the Black Death swept through Europe, profoundly altering its social and economic landscape in ways that would shape its future. The massive population decline caused by the Black Death led to a labour shortage, which fundamentally shifted the balance of power between the peasantry and the landowning classes. Due to this shortage, workers and peasants were able to demand higher wages and improved working conditions. As a result, the feudal system, which had been the dominant social and economic structure in medieval Europe, began to weaken. This weakening of feudalism was marked by increased mobility and bargaining power among the workforce, leading to a decline in serfdom and the emergence of a more market-based economy. A significant consequence of this shift was the rise of a powerful and wealthy merchant class. This new class of merchants, benefiting from the shift in economic focus from agriculture to trade, began to accumulate considerable wealth. Their newfound wealth, combined with the decrease in land prices following the population decline, enabled them to invest in land and property, thereby enhancing their status and influence. As Europe started to recover from the plague, the increased wealth and social mobility of the merchant class sparked a new era of exploration. Driven by the search for new markets and trade opportunities, these merchants became the key proponents and financiers of expeditions. A major motivation for this era of exploration was the pursuit of trade routes to Asia, particularly for spices and luxury goods. This pursuit was further spurred by geopolitical shifts such as the decline of the Byzantine Empire and the fall of Constantinople in 1453, which disrupted the traditional land routes to Asia. The confluence of these factors initiated a period of unprecedented exploration, setting the stage for the expansion and dominance of European powers in the centuries that followed. The impetus for colonization and exploration during this period was significantly bolstered by the concurrent development of a financial system and the concept of corporations. Previously, financing colonial expeditions was a high-risk endeavor, requiring substantial upfront investment. The individual financier, be it a prince, king or lord, bore the entire risk, and a single shipwreck could result in a catastrophic financial loss. However, the socio-economic upheaval wrought by the Black Death in Europe also gave rise to a more sophisticated banking system born out of the transition to a trade-oriented economy. This change necessitated advanced methods of managing finances, which led to the establishment of early banking practices in medieval city-states like Florence and Venice, renowned for their vibrant trade. These early banks introduced practices such as currency exchange, fund transfers, and loan provision. A particularly significant development was the formation of joint stock companies. These entities revolutionized the funding of overseas ventures by allowing the pooling of capital from multiple investors. This era witnessed the rise of influential joint stock companies like the Dutch East India Company and the British East India Company, which played pivotal roles in colonial expansion. The joint stock model meant that risk was distributed among numerous shareholders. For instance, instead of one individual investing in a single ship, a hundred people could invest in a hundred ships, sharing both the risks and the profits. The availability of credit and the ability to accumulate capital through joint stock companies made lengthy and hazardous colonial expeditions feasible for European powers. The trade in exotic items such as spices, textiles, and, regrettably, the inhumane trade in enslaved people was financed and supported by this evolving financial system. The rise of this financial system was also highly beneficial to the artisans back in Europe. For the first time, they had access to capital through loans, a critical resource for purchasing materials, upgrading tools and expanding their workshops. Additionally, the banking system provided mechanisms for secure and efficient money transfers. This service was particularly invaluable for artisans looking to tap into distant markets where carrying large sums of money was impractical and risky. 
Furthermore, some early banks offered rudimentary forms of insurance and risk management, providing a safety net for artisans against the loss of materials or workshop damages due to unforeseen circumstances. This reduced risk allowed artisans, inventors and engineers to begin experimenting with new ideas and designs, further strengthening the burgeoning colonial and financial systems through proto-scientific revolutions such as the Renaissance. Innovations in navigation and shipbuilding, including the development of the astrolabe, the compass, and significant advancements in cartography, along with the design of more durable and maneuverable ships, made long and perilous sea voyages increasingly feasible. It is worth noting, though, that China also had similar levels, or perhaps better technology, that could have allowed it to colonize the Americas. And although they did not have a sophisticated banking system like the Europeans, they did have a powerful centralized state, which could create many hundreds of naval vessels, if they so desired. In fact, in the early 1400s, Admiral Zheng He led seven major naval expeditions, traveling through the South China Sea, the Indian Ocean, and reaching as far as the eastern coasts of Africa. The fleet included massive ships, some of which were said to be the largest wooden ships ever built. In many ways, the Chinese were the more likely candidates than Europe to eventually colonize the Americas. However, this did not materialize into an effort comparable to European colonization. After the death of Zheng He and the accession of the Xuande Emperor, Chinese policy shifted markedly. Some semi-mythological accounts of this period claim that China was hit by a bad storm and seeing this as a bad omen, the emperor destroyed China's navy. In the mid-15th century, a series of laws known as the Sea Bans were implemented. These laws restricted private maritime trade and decommissioned and destroyed much of the navy. And unlike in Europe, where the merchant class had a say in such laws, the emperor's word was final with the merchant class holding little sway over Chinese affairs. Thus, as a result of these policies, China's shipbuilding and navigational skills, which were once among the most advanced in the world, began to stagnate and eventually fall behind those of emerging European powers. But as we have already explored, the same conditions did not exist in Europe. Unlike China, Europe was fragmented between many competing states. Thus, there was no centralized power which could do something as monumental as banning all maritime trade in Europe as was the case in China. If one state had banned maritime trade, another state simply would have seized the opportunity to fill that economic void. And besides, after the fall of the feudal system in Western Europe, the merchant class were far too powerful and influential for that to actually happen. Aside from colonial ventures, the early form of capitalism that rose from the ashes of the feudal system would also benefit the economies and societies of early modern Europe, eventually paving the way for the Industrial Revolution that would cement Western European power. Again, much of these beneficial changes can be linked to the Black Death. The first of these was agricultural stability. This dramatic decrease in population led to a surplus of food and agricultural resources. With fewer mouths to feed, the pressure on food supplies eased, reducing the likelihood of famines. Furthermore, with fewer people to feed and a surplus of land, agricultural practices began to change. Landowners and farmers started experimenting with new and more efficient farming techniques, such as crop rotation and the use of fertilizers, to improve yields. The shift from the traditional two-field system to the more productive three-field system in many parts of Europe was a significant step in this direction. This increased agricultural productivity was vital. As agricultural productivity increased, fewer laborers were needed in the fields. This surplus labor then became available for industrial work, which was usually higher paid. This increase in higher paid jobs also played a leading role in the West's industrialization and dominant position in the world economy. Initially spurred by the labor shortages caused by the Black Death and maintained by an increase in industrial work, this uptick in earnings significantly impacted consumer spending. With increased disposable income, people could then afford a greater quantity of goods, 
including those produced by artisans. This early form of consumerism enabled artisans to boost their profits and reinvest in their businesses, or alternatively, to spend their earnings on goods crafted by other artisans. This cycle further stimulated demand for such products and contributed to rising wages. This phenomenon, often referred to as the Industrious Revolution, was particularly prominent in Northwestern Europe. It allowed real wages, the cost of goods relative to wages, to remain comparatively high, laying the groundwork for the eventual Industrial Revolution. However, the expansion of Northwestern European economies encountered several challenges. According to basic economic principles, a surge in demand without a corresponding increase in supply inevitably leads to price inflation, thereby diminishing the real wages of the average worker. Indeed, traditional artisans in Britain initially found it challenging to meet the growing demand. This dilemma of augmenting supply to counteract price inflation was further exacerbated by the high costs associated with hiring additional workers to enhance manufacturing output. This economic paradox is exemplified by the view of Delaunay des Landes, an 18th century French commentator, who argued that the English glass industry couldn't compete with French prices due to higher English wages. But rather than being outcompeted by goods produced with cheaper labour in other countries, Britain embarked on a remarkable path. They began industrialising, utilising labour-saving machinery to maintain competitiveness. This shift towards industrialization was largely enabled by specific conditions existing within Britain at the time. One such condition was the high level of wages in Britain. Due to these high wages, it became more economically sensible for artisans and aspiring business owners to develop and implement new machinery rather than hiring more expensive labor. A prime example of this is the Arkwright system, which revolutionized textile production by mechanizing spinning processes, significantly reducing the need for manual labor. This innovation could yield a return of around 40%, making it a highly lucrative investment. In contrast, in a country like France, where wages were lower, the same system would only generate a return of about 9%, as the cost-saving benefits of the machinery were less impactful in a lower wage environment. In other major textile producing nations, such as India, the situation was even more pronounced. Real wages in India were approximately six times lower than in Britain, meaning an Indian artisan looking to expand their textile business would find it more economical to hire additional low-wage workers rather than invest in expensive machinery that offered limited cost-saving benefits. Another critical factor contributing to Britain's industrial advantage was the availability of cheap coal, essential for powering the machinery that drove the Industrial Revolution. Particularly in Northeast England, the cost of energy relative to wages was significantly lower than in other countries. This economic dynamic made it more viable to develop and use machines powered by fossil fuels, as opposed to employing more workers, which was a more expensive alternative. The availability of cheap British coal can be partly attributed to good fortune, as Britain had abundant coal reserves in conveniently accessible locations, a stark contrast to China or many other European states. However, the reason for cheap fuel in northern England was not just geographic luck. Other regions, like the Ruhr in Germany, also had abundant coal in accessible locations, but did not experience a comparable reduction in coal prices until much later. The lower cost of coal in 18th century Britain can also be linked to the country's early adoption of fossil fuels, driven by economic forces dating back to the 16th century. Due to deforestation and population growth in cities such as London, wood became increasingly expensive, far surpassing the cost of coal. By 1585, wood fuel was twice the price of coal in London, providing a strong economic incentive for Britain to capitalise on fossil fuels far earlier than its contemporaries. This initial shift sparked a virtuous cycle of increasing economies of scale, further reducing coal prices in Britain and enabling the country to remain competitive by utilising fossil fuels in its burgeoning industrial machines. The final and more troubling aspect of Britain's early industrial success 
lay in its need for cheap raw materials. Affordable fuel and machinery were futile without the necessary inputs for production. Historian Kenneth Pomeranz estimated that to meet the burgeoning industrial demand for raw resources, the UK would need to cultivate approximately 25 million acres of land. However, this posed a significant challenge as the UK itself only had about 17 million acres of cultivated land. The problem was particularly acute in the textile industry, which required an additional 9 million acres dedicated to sheep farming to meet the needs of the new industrial machinery. Without finding new sources of raw materials, the Industrial Revolution might not have been feasible. Britain, along with other European nations, addressed the challenge of raw material scarcity through their colonial enterprises around the globe. Cotton serves as a prime example of this. Grown on lands originally inhabited by Native Americans and picked by slaves brought to the United States by European merchants, this exploitative system was crucial in maintaining Britain's high industrial output. Besides cotton, Britain also imported substantial quantities of wool, particularly from Australia. Timber was another vital resource sourced from the colonies. With Britain's own forests significantly depleted due to naval expansion and domestic consumption, the vast woodlands of North American colonies became indispensable suppliers. In the later part of the 19th century, Britain also heavily relied on its colonies or former colonies, such as the United States, for resources like rubber, iron and copper ore. Additionally, Britain exploited the extensive agricultural lands in its colonies for commodities like tea, sugar, coffee and tobacco. While these products did not directly contribute to industrial manufacturing processes, they generated significant revenue, bolstering the industrial growth within Britain. Thus, the acquisition and use of colonised lands for raw material extraction played a crucial role in fueling the Industrial Revolution, albeit at a significant human and ethical cost. With the establishment of capital-intensive systems, economic production experienced a significant surge through a blend of expansion and specialization. The advent of factories is a salient example of this change, leading to an increased division of labor and, consequently, a dramatic rise in productivity. At the dawn of the Industrial Revolution, Adam Smith highlighted the efficiency of this division of labor by describing the productivity in a state-of-the-art pin factory in France. He observed that 10 men in specialized roles could produce 48,000 pins in a single day. In stark contrast, an individual artisan working alone would struggle to make even one pin per day. This trend towards specialization, amplified by machinery, had far-reaching implications for national competitiveness. Consider the textile industry. In 1780, English textile workers, thanks to these efficiencies, were about 100 times more productive per hour than their Indian counterparts. As a result, the cost of goods produced in England fell dramatically, enabling consumers to purchase more and thus boosting the profitability of these companies. At the same time, this undercut competition from countries like India and China. Consequently, India, once a leader in the textile industry, saw its exports of these goods halve between 1790 and 1850, outcompeted by the more efficiently produced British goods. The Industrial Revolution irrevocably shifted the global balance of power, enabling Western nations, initially Britain, and subsequently other Northwestern European countries and the United States, to attain an unprecedented level of dominance. The profits from these industrial ventures were reinvested into further technological advancements, perpetuating a cycle of economic growth and capital accumulation that spurred ongoing industrial expansion. Furthermore, the Industrial Revolution was instrumental in advancing military capabilities. Britain leveraging its industrial prowess, constructed a powerful navy and a formidable army, essential in establishing and sustaining colonies worldwide. This laid the foundation for over two centuries of European and later American dominance in the global economy. However, understanding why this period of Western economic dominance persisted for so long is a complex and multifaceted issue 
as intricate as the reasons behind the West's initial rise to prominence. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for the next two videos in this series, which explore how the colonial empire's economies worked and how the modern-day US is able to use the dollar as a significant means of control, which allows Western hegemony to continue.